जय गुरुदेव टूडेज यू गो सिस्टर्स रियली ब्यूटिफुल इट इज गोइंग टू बी अबाउट द बॉडी एंड द माइंड एंड वॉट इज द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन द बॉडी एंड द माइंड एंड वी विल गो डीपर इन टू द रियलाइजेशन दैट Udalaka had about the body and the mind, and how f- from that realization he moves towards enlightenment. Yeah. So let's begin with page one eighty nine. Udalaka continued to contemplate. When the mind perceives the body as distinct from it, abandons its. own conditioning the concepts and recognizes its own transient nature it is victorious mind and body are each other's foes hence supreme happiness follows their destruction for when they come together there is a host of suffering on account of their mutual conflict the mind gives birth to the body through its own thought force and throughout the body's lifetime the mind feeds it with its own sorrow thus tortured by sorrow the body wishes to destroy the mind its own parent there is no friend nor enemy in this world that which gives us pleasure is considered our friend and that which causes pain is our enemy when thus the mind and the body are constantly engaged in mutual destruction how can one have happiness it is by the destruction of the mind that there can be happiness hence the body tries every day in deep sleep to destroy the mind however until the self knowledge is attained one unwittingly promotes the strength of the other and they seem to function together for a common purpose even as water and fire though opposed to each other work together for a common cause for example cooking so let's understand this yeah here we are talking about mind and body yeah how did the mind come into being it's from the first i yeah so the mind is created from i okay so there was the first i that is what is the mind let's treat this as one entity this is the parent this says i am earth i am water i am fire i am air all these elements combined together permutation and combination leads to the formation of the physical body so the mind is the parent the body is the child yeah if you want to write here parent and this is the child yes when the mind perceives the body as distinct from it abandons its own conditioning the concepts and recognizes its own transient nature it is victorious yes just because the mind gave birth to the body the mind has and the body start behaving like one unit and you start thinking that you are this body mind complex yeah you forget your essential nature the day the mind perceives the body as distinct from itself when it separates the body from itself and abandons its own conditioning and recognizes its own transient nature transient means ever changing yeah the mind is constantly changing yes so it has a tra- transient nature then only is it victorious mind and body are each other's foes means they are enemies 
Hence, supreme happiness follows their destruction. Only when these both are destroyed, then only can there be happiness. Then only can you be happy. Happiness cannot be there until the mind and body exist. They have to be destroyed for happiness to even come up, to arise. Because when they come together, there is a host of suffering on account of their mutual conflict. So there is a lot of mutual conflict happening between the mind and the body. And what is the mutual conflict? Let's look at that. The mind gives birth to the body. Through its own thought force, this we know, the thought force is I. I want to be this. And throughout the body's lifetime, the mind feeds it with its own sorrow. I want this, I don't want this, I like this, I don't like this. Yeah, the body says, enough, I am full, my stomach is full. But your mind says, no, one more gulab jamun, one more rasgulla, one more slice of pizza, yeah? one more candy. Yes? And you keep torturing the body. The body says, oh enough, I am tired. I don't want to see anything. I want to shut my eyes and go to sleep. But you say, no, that beautiful lady on the television serial. Just one more episode. yeah. And then you keep pushing the body. The body says, I need to sleep. I need to rest. But you are saying, no, I need to complete this particular work. You are not listening to the body. Yes, you are constantly listening to the mind. The body says, I'm done with sex. Mind says, more, 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 more sex. Yeah? So you are constantly sucking at the energy of the body. Yes, The body is actually working on half its battery. Yeah? You keep sucking at its energy. You suck the battery out of the body. So that is where there is a constant conflict between the mind and the body. A constant conflict. If you are really subtly aware of what is happening in your inner environment, you will recognize this, that, oh, I am doing this to myself. Yeah? And it is in every aspect. It's in sight, it's in taste, it's in touch, it's in smell and it is in hearing. Yeah? Our body says, enough, I'm not interested in any more music. The mind says, no, really loud, hard rock, what, hard metal, whatever, loud music. Yeah? So we have to learn to listen to the body, which we are not doing. There's a constant conflict which happens between the mind and the body. And because of this constant conflict, the body wishes to destroy the mind. Yeah? Let, let's read that. The mind gives birth to the body through its own thought force. And throughout the body's lifetime, the mind feeds it with its own sorrow. Thus, tortured by sorrow, the body wishes to destroy the mind, its own parent. There is no friend nor enemy in this world. That which gives us pleasure is considered our friend. And that which gives us pain is our enemy. Yes. Sukhasya dukhasya na kopi data. There is no giver of pleasure or pain, of sukha or dukha. Yeah. When thus the mind and the body are constantly engaged in a mutual destruction, how can one have happiness? How? Isn't this fight between the mind and body really amazing? The mind is not listening to the body. The body hates the mind, wants to kill it. Constant struggle, a constant struggle is going on. Yeah? 
That's why we say, no, oh, I am at war with my own self. This is the war that all of us are facing. But we are just not aware enough of what is happening in our inner environment. And we keep seeking happiness, which never comes our way because of this inner conflict between the parent and the child. It is by the destruction of the mind that there can be happiness. Hence, the body tries every day in deep sleep to destroy the mind. However, until self-knowledge is attained, one unwittingly promotes the strength of the other and they seem to function all together for a common purpose. Even as water and fire, though opposed to each other, work together for a common cause. Example, cooking. Yeah. So this is very interesting. The body tries to kill the mind in deep sleep. As in deep sleep, you do not have dreams. right? So in deep sleep, it's a switch off. But there is no awareness even. Yeah. So it is the body's attempt to kill the mind. Yeah, to move to no mind. Yes. So it's a constant conflict between body and mind. Only in self-knowledge can this conflict be stopped. And they can both mutually work together towards a good cause. Yeah? Like self-growth, like spiritual growth. It is just like an inner cooking. Yeah. Don't you think you are cooking really on high flame since the time you started on the path of knowledge? And it's kind of difficult even, right? Applying all these principles again and again, being a witness, not getting carried away by Raga and Dvesha, all that burning inside of cravings, letting it go and just being at peace. Though the mind comes up and does chitta chatter, chitta chatter, all the drama happening inside and outside and dealing with all this and still being very calm and pleasant. Oh, so difficult, isn't it? But it's still possible. Yeah, why? This is where the mind and body come together. In self-knowledge, they work together and make this happen. Let's go ahead now. If the mind ceases to be, the body ceases to be too on account of the cessation of thought force and mental conditioning. But the mind does not cease to be when the body dies. Hence, one should strive to kill the mind. Mind is like a forest with thought forms for its trees and cravings for its creepers. But by destroying these, I attain bliss when the mind is dead, whether the body, composed of flesh, blood, etc., exists or not, does not matter to me. That I am not the body is obvious, for the corpse does not function. It's so beautiful, no? If the mind ceases to be, the body ceases to be. Yeah? It was the mind that gave birth to the body. Yes, because the mind is, that is why the body is. Now, if I want to destroy all this maya, all this illusion, so what do I have to destroy? The source from where it is born, no? The source is the mind. From the mind, all this illusion of body and then the relationships of this body and the mind, mind, mindness of the body and I want, I want of the body and I don't want, I don't want. All this drama has come out of where? The mind. So, when the mind ceases to be, the body will automatically cease to be. But if you try the other way around, that... I destroy the body. Will the mind get destroyed? No. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Because this mind will create another body. That is why it is said in the scriptures 
that we should never even attempt suicide. Yeah? In suicide, what are you doing? Because you are you are upset and depressed and all because of the drama of the mind has killed you literally. You want to end the body thinking that ending the body will end the drama of the mind. But that's not what happens. You end the body, this mind gives birth to another body out of that vasana. Yeah? Which is an even worse birth for you. Yeah? The things that you were running away from, they have created such strong impressions. Now the new birth or the new body will give you that same dukkha multiplied ten times. Yeah? So, the wise thing to do is to kill the mind. To recognize this is all because of the mind. Yeah? If the mind ceases to be, the body ceases to be too. On account of the cessation of thought form and mental conditioning. Obviously, mental conditioning and thought form stop. Another body is not gained. But the mind does not cease to be when the body dies. This is clear? Hence, one should strive to kill the mind. Mind is like a forest with thought forms for trees and cravings are the creepers. Yeah? The cravings are growing on these trees all around them. By destroying these, I attain bliss. Okay? Completely cut down the forest. You cannot say I will just remove the creepers. They will keep growing back again. Yeah? Completely cutting down the forest of thought forms is the solution. By destroying these, I attain bliss. When the mind is dead, whether the body which is composed of flesh, blood, etc. exists or not, does not matter. That I am not the body is obvious, for the corpse does not function. It's a nice way of putting it, no? A dead body, yeah, which has no life force in it, it cannot function on its own. Yeah? The body dies does not mean I die. I move on. I am that energy. Yes. And that energy which will give rise to another body after one body dies is the mind and its impressions and its ragas and dveshas and all these vasanas collected together give rise to more and more body. So if I have to get out of this cycle of birth and death of the body, I have to learn to kill the mind. Yes. We'll go ahead with the last paragraph on the page. When there is self-knowledge, there is neither mind, nor the senses, nor the tendencies and habits, the concepts and percepts. I have attained that supreme state. I have emerged victorious. I have attained liberation, nirvana. I have risen above all relationships with the mind, body and the senses, even as the oil pressed out of the seeds has no relation to them. To me now the mind, body and the senses are playthings, purity, total fulfillment of all desires, hence their absence, friendliness to all, truthfulness, wisdom, tranquility and blissfulness, sweetness of speech, supreme magnanimity lustrousness, one-pointedness, realization of cosmic unity, fearlessness, absence of divided consciousness, non-perversity. These are my constant companions, since at all times, everything everywhere happens in every manner. In me, there is no desire or aversion towards anything, whether pleasant or unpleasant. Since all delusion has come to an end, since the mind has ceased to be and all evil thoughts have vanished, I rest peacefully in my own self. Yeah. 
This is so beautifully described, no? Where there is self-knowledge, there is neither mind nor the senses. Yeah? Senses belong to the body. Yeah? So where there is self-knowledge, they are not separate mind and body. Yeah? So where there is self-knowledge, there is neither mind nor the senses, nor the tendencies and habits, the concepts and percepts. I have attained that supreme state. I have emerged victorious. That is the meaning of Jai Gurudev. Na? Victory to the mind. Yeah. So I have emerged victorious. I have attained liberation or nirvana. Liberation or nirvana from what? From this maya. From this world of illusion. Of people, situations and things. Yes, from this drama. I have attained Nirvana. I have risen above all relationships with the body, mind and senses. Yes. Just like oil pressed out of the seeds has no relationship anymore with them. Yeah. Just like that. All the illusions and delusions have left. Yes. I may still be in mind-body complex, but it has no relationship with me. Just like a few pages ago, he described that an iron rod lying next to a stone has no relationship with it. Just like that. Yeah, I may exist in this world amongst the same people, situations and things in the same body-mind complex, but... In self-knowledge, I have risen to a state where I have no relationship with all this. Yeah. To me now, the mind, body and the senses are just playthings. Now, the rest of the paragraph is the qualities or the constant companions of one who is in Self-knowledge. What are they? Purity. Total fulfillment of desires, hence their absence means no desires in the mind. Yeah. What is, is complete contentment and acceptance of what is. Actually, acceptance also implies that there was a prior rejection. So it's not an acceptance, just being with what is. What is, is. No desires, that is the meaning of the second one. Yeah. Third is friendliness to all. It doesn't matter how the other person behaves. A friendliness to all. Because finally it is just external prakriti. Internally we are the same purusha. Truthfulness, as in not just not speaking lies from your lips. It also means being established in the truth, in the purusha. Recognizing that all this is unreal. All these people, situations and things, this prakriti, everything is transient. It is temporary, it is moving and that which is transient cannot be real. Only that which is permanent is real. The Purusha is permanent and that is real. Wisdom. Tranquility. Yeah? Tranquility, you understand? Complete calmness, relaxed mind. Yeah? There is no graph going up or down or up or down. Yeah? A Sambhava, that is tranquility. A blissfulness, yeah, happiness. Sweetness of speech. Yeah, when nothing really bothers you, when you are completely in some bhava, when the graph does not go up or down, yeah, sweet speech automatically comes out of you. Supreme magnanimity. Yeah, very generous. Wanting to help others as much as possible. Yeah? Going out of your way and being generous to others is supreme magnanimity. 
lustrousness means ever shining yeah not just shining from your face as in a glow on the face but shining from within as a person a person who is radiant yeah one pointedness yeah complete focus in life very clear and that pointedness is on what not on the prakriti on the purusha on the consciousness that i am the self yeah. realization of cosmic unity yeah this understanding that all this is just the brahman the trees the flowers the houses the people the animals the insects the cars the mountains the trees the planets the entire solar system everything is just one really one energy one pulsating energy which is the cosmic consciousness or brahman fearlessness it's a quality of the gods abhaya it's a beautiful quality to really have where nothing touches you nothing it doesn't matter whether it is an angry boss or an angry spouse it doesn't matter whether it is bankruptcy or a, a broken down situation a broken down house yeah it doesn't matter nothing can scare you nothing can instill fear in you because of that realization that i am that purusha and being constantly established in that purusha then is little little things of the prakriti don't move you just like when you were a kid if your toy truck or your toy car or your toy doll broke you would feel this is the end of the world and cry and cry and cry as if the whole sky has fallen on your head isn't it yeah but today does a broken doll or a broken little item like that shake you so much no na no. a natural maturity has brought in you a fearlessness you know where little little things breaking is concerned yeah the same thing you multiply a thousand 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 times a million times a complete fearlessness of whatever happens in this prakriti it does not shake you yeah absence of divided consciousness yeah we always think oh i am different he is different you know i am a different personality he is a different personality you justify also a lot of your flaws by saying oh you know i'm different and he's different yeah but a person who reaches this state realizes everybody is just one there is no difference we are all the same waves yeah one wave calls itself mohit one wave is jayshree one wave is mitesh it doesn't matter they are all but one the same ocean yeah this recognition is where you don't see a division at all yeah non perversity perversity is that unreasonable desire to go on continuing with an unreasonable behavior you know right now what you are arguing about with your friend or your spouse is unreasonable but your ego says no i am somebody and i said it so i said it so i will stick to it and you know it is unreasonable behavior and you should not be talking like this but you continue to talk like that and you continue to behave like that that is called a perversity yes so in such an individual there is complete non perversity yeah all these become your constant 
companions. Since at all times everything everywhere happens in every manner, in me there is no desire or aversion towards anything whether pleasant or unpleasant. Yeah. What is, is no raga, no dvesha. Whatever is happening is fine. Just fine. Everything is great hunky-dory, it's fine. Everything is horrible, disastrous, falling apart, it's fine. The yogi maintains some bhava. He doesn't have to make an effort in maintaining. Yeah. That is his nature. That becomes his nature. Because he's so established in the Purusha. In fact, for him to get drowned in Raga or Dvesha is more effort. Yeah. This is really effortless. Very simple. Very easy. Sadho, Sahaj, Samadhi, Bhali. That samadhi which happens simply, easily, effortlessly, that is the best. That is the highest form of samadhi. Sadho, sahad samadhi bhali. Since all delusion has come to an end, since the mind has ceased to be and all evil thoughts have vanished, I rest peacefully in my own self. Yeah. Sadho Sahad Samadhi Bhali. Yeah. It's a Doha of Sant Kabir. Yeah. Okay. We move on to page 190. On page 190 is the process of Udalaka's enlightenment. Yeah? There is nothing much to explain, but as we read through it, you can actually visualize it, you know, how beautifully it happened to Udalaka. Yes? It's also a lot of poetic license here to describe the beauty of that nirvana or attainment of enlightenment. So just let's read through this. Yeah? No explanation required as it's just a happening. Yeah? Vashishta continued, The sage Uddalaka then sat down in the lotus posture with his eyes half closed. In meditation, he uttered the word Om, which bestows the highest state. He intoned Om in such a way that its vibrations fill his whole being right up to the crown of his head. As the first part of his practice, he exhaled his breath completely. It was as if his life force had abandoned the body and was roaming in the space of pure consciousness. The fire that arose from his heart burned the whole of his body. All this Udalaka practiced without the violence involved in Hatha Yoga, for Hatha Yoga gives rise to pain. With the second utterance of the holy word Om, he reached the state of equilibrium, and there happened in him a spontaneous detention of the breath, life force, without agitation or vibration. The life force stood still, as it were, neither outside nor inside neither below nor above. After reducing the body to ashes, the fire burnt itself out and vanished. Only the pure ashes were visible. It was as if the very bones had turned into camphor, which was being burnt in adoration. The ashes were blown by a powerful wind and dispersed in space. All this happened without the violence of Hatha Yoga. In the third stage, when the holy word Om reached its culmination or tranquility, there arose the inhalation of breath, the drawing in of the life force. During this stage, the life forces, which were in the very center of the nectar of consciousness, spread out in space as a cool breeze. These forces reached 
the region of the moon where they spread out as auspicious rays which thereupon rained on the ashes that remained of the body. Instantly there arose from the ashes a radiant being with four arms like Lord Vishnu. Uddalaka shone like a divinity, his whole being transmuted into a divinity. The life force filled the inner Kundalini which was spread out like a spiral. Uddalaka's body had thus been completely purified. Then he who was already seated in the lotus posture made the posture firm, tied up his senses and proceeded to make his consciousness absolutely free from the least movement of thought. With all his strength he restrained his mind from distraction. His half-closed eyes were still and motionless. With his mind established in inner silence, he equalized the movement of the twin life forces, prana and aparna. He withdrew his inner senses from contact with their objects, even as oil is separated from the seed. Whereupon he became directly aware of the mental conditioning created by past experiences and unconditioned the awareness and made it pure. Then he firmly closed his rectum and the other outlets to the body, the eyes, etc. With his life force and awareness thus prevented from externalization by perfect discipline, he held his mind in his heart. So this is a very beautiful process that happened to Udalaka. Yeah? And this is a description which doesn't need any more discussion further. So I will let you read the next page. Yeah? And it just describes how Udalaka reached enlightenment. Yeah? So go ahead, complete reading the next page 191. And we will meet again next week and start with page 192. Yes? Jai Gurudev.